everyone. We want to thank you all for attending today's panel discussion on the documentary Talking Black in America by the Language and Life Project at North Carolina State University. Note that since this is a panel discussion, we cannot hear the microphones of or see the video of participants. So if you are a participant, you do not need to worry about your mic or your camera being on. My name is Ross Sonnenmaker, I go by Chad, and I'm the Executive Director and Communication Manager for Southwest Ohio AEYC. Southwest Ohio AEYC is one of two state-level NAEYC affiliates in Ohio, and we serve members in Cincinnati, Columbus, Dayton, and 16 surrounding counties. I will be co-facilitating today's panel discussion with our Program and Events Committee Chair, Jamal Davis, and our Equity Committee co-chairs, Bella Free and Denise Stewart. We would like to start by thanking the sponsor of today's panel discussion, Learning Grove. For over 40 years, Cincinnati Early Learning Centers and Children Inc. were both well known for their commitment to delivering an outstanding level of early education. On January 1st, 2020, these two highly acclaimed organizations joined efforts combining strengths under a new name, Learning Grove. Now more than ever, they are able to serve a racially and socioeconomically diverse population of nearly 7,000 children, youth, and families annually with programs across Northern Kentucky and Southwest Ohio. Learning Grove believes that the roots of success thrive in an environment of trust and support. They cultivate success by growing knowledge, capabilities, and confidence to allow children and families to flourish now and into the future. Learning Grove develops and supports innovative quality learning experiences that empower children, youth, and families across diverse communities. Together, we transform lives and help build brighter futures. Together, we thrive for lifelong success. You can learn more at learning-grove.org. Now we will hear from Denise for an important message on Juneteenth from our Equity Committee. Denise? First, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, I serve as the Senior Director of Equity and Donor Relations for Learning Growth, and it's my pleasure to um, speak with you this evening. First, I would like to start off by reading a statement about a significant event that just took place the, um, about Juneteenth being named as a national holiday. On January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed nearly 4 million slaves in the United States. However, it wasn't until June 19th, 1865, that the people of Galveston, Texas were told about the proclamation and the slaves there were finally freed. June 19th, 1865, better known as Juneteenth, is sometimes referred to as Black Independence Day or America's Second Independence Day and is celebrated in all but four states in the United States. On Tuesday, June 15, 2021, the Senate, U.S. Senate voted unanimously to make Juneteenth a national holiday to be celebrated each year on June 19th. 158 years after the signing of the proclamation. The House of Representatives overwhelmingly approved it the next day. And of course, President Biden just signed it into law on yesterday. Swayze is committed to disrupting racist systems and policies and using the power of early childhood education programs to prepare children for a more equitable world. As we celebrate Juneteenth in 2021, May we all commit to acknowledging the horror of the enslavement of Black people in the United States, the inequitable treatment that continued for more than a century after the first Juneteenth, and celebrating the rich culture, contributions, and resilience of Black people in this country, despite their continued subjection to oppression, segregation, exclusion, and injustice based on race. We owe this acknowledgement to ourselves and our children so that we can begin and sustain the process of racial healing. Let us continue the fight for justice and equity so that we truly become a nation united with liberty and justice for all. 
Thank you, and I hope you will all take all the, those words into consideration as we celebrate this wonderful holiday tomorrow. Thank you, Denise, uh, Bella, and the rest of the Equity Committee for that important message. Now, Bella will introduce the panel. Bella? Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. We have a phenomenal panel tonight. Um, the, panels, the panelists are listed in alphabetical order, so that's kind of the way that I will go. Um, all these panelists are amazing advocates for equity and education and, and so much more. So um, first we have Cisan Cuervo, who is a certified bilingual speech language pathologist and PhD candidate at the University of Cincinnati. She graduated from Florida International University with a bachelor's in psychology and a master's in communication sciences and disorders. Her expertise and interests are on child language development and literacy skills of culturally and linguistically diverse children. Cisan is a proud Latina from Colombia and her research interest includes examining dual language strategies and resources to support monolingual speech language pathologists and teachers working, working with English language learners. Next, we have Dr. Ebony Griggs Griffin, who is a native of Cleveland, Ohio, but has lived in Cincinnati, Ohio for over 20 years. Her leadership experience has offered her the opportunity to serve in various positions within the higher education and not-for-profit sector. She has spent the last seven years working in the field of early childhood education with the Community Action Agency. And currently she serves in the position of Vice President of Community Services. She received her bachelor and master's degrees in education from the University of Cincinnati and her doctoral degree in higher education with a foundation of leadership and social justice from Union Institute and University. She believes in using her experience, skills and talents to serve. A quote in which drives her work is, if serving is below you, then leadership is beyond you. Next, we have Damian Hoskins, who is the general manager of Elements, the premier hip hop cultural arts center in Cincinnati. Through the preservation, protection, and promotion of hip hop as art, culture, and a global creative force, Elements fosters talent, ignites potentials, and inspires possibilities. Previously, Hoskins was vice president of Arts Impact at Arts Wave, the leading fundraiser and promoter of the arts in greater Cincinnati. Prior to that, Hoskins worked for Hamilton County's Head Start program, including the launch of the Preschool Promise Initiative. Damien is also an oil painter and graphic designer. He holds a bachelor's degree in English education from Central State University and a master's degree from the Art Academy of Cincinnati. Next, we have Dr. Cole Perry, who is a youth worker and Spanish language teacher in the Cincinnati area. Cole's work with young people has often involved facilitating restorative and transformative accountability processes around racist harm. Cole has published academically and done trainings for youth workers on the basis of doing this work as a white educator. Cole's studies in linguistics and human and community development and 18 years of experience in the field inform an understanding of language, racism, and resistance as integral to working with kids. Finally, we have Lauren Prather, who is a doctoral student at the University of Cincinnati in Communication Sciences and Disorders. She received her Master of Science degree from Tennessee State University in Communication Sciences and Disorders and her Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Memphis in Communications. Lauren's research interest is in language and literacy for underserved populations, specifically focusing on African-American English dialect. Her research is on comparing African-American English in story retells by using bi-dialectal stories. Thank you again to all of our panelists for participating. And I believe next up, we are going to move right into questions. Does that sound good, Chad? Great. Yep. So the first question um, that we have curated for you all, we'll go one by one, um, is how do you identify? So race, age, ethnicity, orientation, 
ability, um, anything you, you would like to include or feel comfortable including and sharing with uh, the participants? And then how do you think your identity affects your perspective during this discussion today? Um, so shall we go forward in a similar order and start with CSAN, if that's all right? Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm CSAN. Um, I identify as a proud Latina, born and raised in Colombia. I identified as an English language learner. So I learned English as a second language when I was 12. Um, and I have a very special place in my heart uh, for African American English. So I'm very honored to have been invited to this panel discussion. Um, I believe that my identity as a brown woman, a minority woman, um, is going to affect my perspective uh, during this discussion because I have a lot of Black friends, I have a lot of Black colleagues uh, who speak the dialect, who love it who are passionate and who have advocated and taught me a lot. I've served a lot of black children, clients, families who I love and respect. Um, and so it, that's an honor to be here. Looking forward to the discussion. Great, and uh, Dr. Ebony Griggs Griffin. Yes, hello and thank you for having me on. I am super excited um, to be amongst those who are know very well and um, to have this conversation. I identify as a um, African American, a black woman. Um, identify as a change agent. And when I think about age, I'm not gonna say my age, but I am definitely a part of the hip hop generation. So I have an appreciation for uh, Mr. Hoskins and what he has to offer <laughs> to this space and the work, because I am truly a part of that generation. Um, and it exudes through me in some ways. And, um, you know, my identity um, offers me a lens in this conversation. My intersectionality as a woman, as a, a woman of color, I'm a Black woman, but also whose family is from the South. And so, you know, my perspective and hearing my grandmother say, dying now, and I'm trying to learn and understand that, and that's just what I was under, um, it's, it's, it's my family, it's what I know. And so um, my lens here um, definitely offers a perspective of um, appreciation for um, this conversation and for the dialect. Thank you. I, yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate that perspective as well. Um, Damien, would you care to go next? Sure. Um, good evening, everyone. Good to see everyone. Dr. Griffin, good to see you. Uh, I'm a Black guy. Um, I'm old. I'm super old. I'm 47. Um, I am a native Cincinnatian. My family hails from mostly the South migrating North uh, to Cincinnati. Um, and I feel like that the perspective as a black person uh, influences how you perceive America period. Um, and that's an ongoing struggle. Um, that perception often remains rooted in authenticity uh, despite the fact that um, much of what America tends to present itself as is almost dichotomous and contradictory. So as your authenticity forces, my authenticity forces growth, uh, America seems to be moving in a forward pace te technologically, but in regressively <laughs> and, and socioeconomics and, and, and social standings and equity and things of that sort. So my perspective will be one of truth, um, sometimes old man truth, which is a hard truth, like drinking bourbon straight, uh, but it will be definitely rooted in authenticity. Uh, and so my grandmother taught me not to lie, otherwise she'd pop me in the mouth. So we won't have any of that. So you'll get a lot of truth from my perspective. We need some hard truth sometimes in this country, all the time. <laughs> Really, so thank you for that. Um, Cole? Hi, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, 
I'm really honored to be here with everyone uh, and so many talented, knowledgeable people. Um, I, yeah, I think most relevant for our discussion is, is that I'm white, right? Um, I moved through society as a white person and benefiting from ongoing structures of white supremacy and settler colonialism. So like, obviously I, I, I can't say anything today about talking as a black person or being as a black person. Um, my contributions I think should, will be on uh, the basis of some formal education in linguistics and race specifically and, and on work trying to challenge racism in, in my work with youth. Um, but I don't know, in my opinion, whatever I say is today in this panel is only useful to the extent that, you know, I'm able to apply what I've learned from uh, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color to the work that we're talking about, to working with kids, to language. So um, I don't know. Yeah, we, we all live in a world deeply enriched by the African diaspora and Black culture and, and Black English specifically. So um, I don't know. I'll I'll, uh, I'll try not to outlive my uh, or ex overextend my usefulness as a, a white person on today's panel. But uh, thanks for having me here, folks. I guess that leaves me, Bella. Right? Yep. yep. Go ahead. Take it away, Lauren. <laughs> Say hey, everybody. So I am from the South. I identify as a Black woman. I am a Tennessean all the way. Um, hence my undergrad studies. Um, but I also identify as a bi-dialectal speaker, um, depending who I'm talking to and see I knows, I will switch it up really quickly, but I'm gonna try to do my best to um, be as much as um, fluent in um, general American English as possible. But um, my perspective will bring a more positive, uplifting um, perspective to this panel. And also, I also say like a defensive way. And I say that because I always feel myself when I'm showcasing the beauty of Black language and Black culture, um, I find myself having to prove its essence or its influence um, amongst like um, the American society, right? And so I'm always proving it through like historical events, making it relevant through their research studies and even de definitions talking about like characteristics of Black English, um, Black language, whoever, depends on who you're talking to, it's Black language over here and African-American English over here. So there's um, different differences in those terms as well. But um, Black language, I just truly believe, has just um, as much prestige as the majority of what society considers mainstream or the standard. And honestly, like the more that I I took my comps over this um, and studied it a little bit deeper, the more and more I read and learn more, I realize that standard um, that the standard or mainstream American English is just general American English. It's really not a standard, and it's also too a dialect of. A British English, just to be honest. So that's kind of the perspective I'm going to be coming from um, into in terms of that way. So that's a little bit about me. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for that. I really, uh, we all really appreciate um, all of those really valuable perspectives. And I, I think um, Jamal is next. We're going to alternate uh, taking turns between myself and Jamal and Denise asking um, some other questions as well. So thank you for sharing all of your identities. All right. Yes. Thank you. Wonderful panel. So here's the next question. Share a little with us about your work and what you thought of the documentary Talking Black in America and what were your personal takeaways? So we'll follow the same suit. So Ms. Hassan, you can go ahead. No, that's not fair, but that's okay. We just we spice it up a little bit. Next, next question. <laughs> but I'll, I'll take this one on. Um, so a little bit about my work. As it was said, I'm a speech pathologist. I work um, with early childhood, early intervention. So children from zero up to 12 years old is kind of what I've worked with the most. Um, home for me is Miami, Florida. So I come from working with a very diverse population. Um, a lot of multicultural, multilingual children is, are the kids who I've worked with the most and families. Um, and I am now doing my PhD and kind of digging more into the area of research. Um, 
which I'll talk a little bit about the importance of later on as kind of one of the gaps. Um, but to like the meat and potatoes of what this documentary, um, what I thought of, which I loved, Lauren had, Lauren brought this documentary to UC like last year, like two years ago. Um, and we watched it and we had an awesome discussion about it too. I love this documentary. I feel like, oh, this is just so warming to my heart. Um, just like to see the people and to learn the history and to learn the richness of black language and the dialect. Um, my personal takeaways were a few. One, language is always right. I love that phrase. I loved it so much because you know, AAE is just such a strong characteristic of culture and you can't take it away from each other. So for me, just to know that um, dialect is spoken like by my black clients and friends and family and is part of who they are. Um, it's the home language, just like Spanish is my home language. So I appreciate it and I value it and I love it and I acknowledge that I have a lot to learn. Um, and my other takeaway is that there is a lot of beauty in Black language. Um, and there is a lot of richness there. And so I just enjoyed the documentary very much. And I enjoyed learning a lot about the history. Um, and yeah, those were a few of my takeaways. All right, thank you, Mr. Sam. Dr. Ebony Griggs Griffin, you're up. Yes, yeah, so a little bit about um, my work. Um, it, so my my day-to-day, -day, I spent a lot of time. Um, first, I, I started off in elementary education, got to the classroom, was like, yeah, that's not gonna work out for me. So went to uh, the higher education sector and spent a lot of time in that sector, in, in the higher education sector, and then now as a nonprofit organization, and spent my last seven years, as I indicated, in the Head Start uh, department, which, which took me back to where I began. So I was like, no, no classroom. I was right back to it. It's like truly a full circle, um, but just not in the classroom. And so spent a lot of time working with Head Start and working in the area of education and professional development. Um, my thoughts, and I, and I do a lot of work around diversity, inclusion, and equity, and leadership development, a lot of training, et cetera. So that's where my, you know, the things that get you super excited, oh, that's the stuff right there, uh, right, right in there. So uh, uh, thoughts about the documentary. Um, I thought it was a, a phenomenal documentary. It was, I agree with uh, Sifan, is that it was truly that, um, that uh, history of it hearing the dialect, hearing them speak. I mean, I just was just immersed. I just wanted to sit in it and, and be in it. So um, I truly appreciated it. And then, you know, the takeaways. So one of the things that was said in the documentary was our language, and it spoke about both access and a barrier. And I've been super reflective about that. Um, as I wrote my dissertation focused on um, African-American women in the workforce um, and their, their strategies and their struggles. And what I heard in each of the women, with each of the women I interviewed was this code switching. And not just that we have the ability to do it, but that we had to do it, right? So here it is that I have this access as an African-American woman, this Black woman who I have the ability. What, what I sound like on here is not what I sound like. When that woman was playing the, the sound between when she talked to her mother and she talked to her friend and then you hear her talking, that's about right. So when I'm, when I'm talking to my family, my friends, a lot of that Cleveland comes out. <laughs> a lot of times it comes all the way out and I'm not thoughtful about it. I'm just speaking, right? However, I remember my daughter saying to me once, mommy, when you get on the phone, why do you change your voice? And um, as she's gotten older, I've had to explain, you know, some things that when I'm calling about a home, I am purposeful 
and changing how I speak. Um, so this access to it, but also this barrier, if I'm not super careful, my name in and of itself, I, I purposefully make calls and don't say Ebony. I purposefully make calls and say Dr. Griffin or Mrs. Griffin, because when I say Ebony in and of itself, it can potentially already cause a barrier, right? Um, and then I change my language because I understand the impact of um, how my my language can be viewed, how my dialect can be viewed as ignorant or um, not proper. And, and as they said in the um, documentary, broken language for who? Poor language for who? I heard Lauren say the standard, the standard for who? Who is it the standard for? So this, what I really took away from this is just the access and the barrier of, of what we're speaking about. Yes, thank you for that. My family, we joke because sometimes they call me while I'm at the job. It's like you're at work, aren't you? It's like they can tell when I'm switching. So I relate with you there. All right, Mr. Hoskins. Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, please call me Damien. I'm already feeling old. Um, <laughs> Damien. And then when you said 47, I'm like, that's young. That's young. That's not old. But, but thank you. You're very kind. <laughs> uh, my knees would uh, beg to differ. Uh, but anyway, um, so the work that I do, I'm the uh, executive director, uh, general manager, executive director, same thing, uh, of uh, Elements, which is a hip hop cultural arts center. Uh, I'm an artist uh, by, by nature. My father's a painter, uh, grew up uh, being a painter, a graphic designer, uh, and art and hip hop um, are. And I also, let me pack up a little bit. Another part of what makes this important or makes this germane is I was also an English teacher for 13 years. Um, and so all of these things sort of coalesce and I think would probably add some value to this particular conversation. Uh, but basically what this means then is every facet of my life has been a part of, uh, has been focused on communication in one way or another. Uh, either teaching uh, the effectiveness of the quote unquote King's English, um, mostly the middle school kids, uh, or visual communication, or even in my current role, uh, art in, in culture as a, as a caveat or a, a vehicle for communication. Um, and so that's basically the premise of, of, of the things that I do. Uh, the documentary, this is where the old man comes out of me. <laughs> um, it, it's a great documentary, first and foremost. Uh, artistically, the it, it was beautifully uh, created. Um, the content was important. Um, there's something about documentaries of this sort that always makes me defensive because it always seems as if uh, people of color or people uh, uh, who have been historically marginalized and have ways of communication that aren't necessarily traditional tend to always have to explain it, you know? Um, and although that may seem necessary in a broad sense of communication, it almost devalues the importance of how uh, these, uh, we uh, communicate um, as if it needs to be explained to everybody. Um, and it's, it's as my grandmother would say, you know, what happens in this house stays in this house. <laughs> you don't always have to defend it, right? And I think what's interesting about it, and obviously there's parts of the documentary that were really, really uh, uh, perked my interest. Uh, you know, pr uh, Professor Griff, who was, you know, member of Public Enemy, uh, some of the hip hop um, tones and how language interweaves into, into art like that. That's always important, but it's always interesting that there's a, a need to defend Black speak. Uh, but there's always <laughs> this desire to appropriate Black speak, right? Um, when you're talking in a broader sense of communication, I I've heard so many people who are non-Black uh, who use Black colloquialisms uh, and, and incorporate it into everything from newscasts to commercials, to you know uh, uh, how they communicate in advertising and things like that, and you know it's it, I think that that defensiveness in me uh, says um, 
either accept it and embrace it in its authenticity uh and 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 for us as people stop defending it um either that or separate it somehow now you can't separate it obviously so the force then becomes accepting it it's okay for there to be differences there used to when we were kids we grew up um you know with all this language around us being uh the united states of america being a melting pot it's actually better described as a tossed salad because in a tossed salad each one of those different elements gets to keep its integrity its individual integrity but it's still combined to create something harmonious allow for that to happen right and that's that's one of the things that i kept like when i when i read or when i watch documentaries I always like have arguments <laughs> with the tv <laughs> that's my <laughs> and so I'm, I'm arguing with the tv like allow for this kind of richness to be in its authentic form right and allow that to be something that uh can be expressed through documentary uh, uh art forms but not necessarily defended yes thank you damien cole Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm from Cincinnati area too, over here on the Kentucky side of the river. Um, I, I've lived here my whole life, uh, except for the years I was away at school, which, you know, kind of a long time when you go to grad school, but, um, and, and, I, and I've worked for it with young people for a long time, uh, but I'm just uh, starting a sort of career change teaching Spanish in Cincinnati public schools. So language is becoming uh, more central to my youth work. Um, and so one of my degrees is in linguistics. I love learning all things language, um, but I've, I've come to appreciate history more lately. And so that was one of the things I appreciate about the documentary. I appreciated like the historical context of, of racism and resistance. Uh, for me, I think it's really important to think about uh, black English in the context of black culture and uh, in the context of the United States and its history too, right? Like there's this, all these dynamics of power and things going on that I think are a great part of that conversation that I think people are alluding to too. And for me, that was one of my takeaways is uh, keeping that in mind. But uh, I don't know, just learning learning hearing more about black english and african-american english language um I, I was thinking about some of the work i've done in in a language classroom and so in cincinnati pub public schools um you know black students come in with this bi dialectal fluency which it's an asset to language learning right i'm i come in with a, I'm a mono mono dialectal speaker right i just have the one uh, but students who've never taken a foreign language or language other than English, black students come in with able to speak black English uh, and, and code switch in between their two dialects that they speak. Um, and it's in addition to being great for a classroom, it's, I, it's just beautiful in general, right? Um, and we always get to have this, uh, this process where, I don't know, this year we, we, we learned about grammatical tense an aspect. And, and so we get to talk about um, how Black English has a more complex system of aspect, how it, events extend over time than what is called standard English. And so my Black students have this understanding or have this, there's things you can say in Black English that would just take more words uh, in my dialect. Um, and so when we're learning aspect in the Spanish classroom, then we, we've like got that to build on. Um, and it, I don't know, the other, the other thing that's nice about that is um, what I appreciate being able to do is, you know, like my students, they're, they're fluent in black English, um, but to uh, one thing we get to do as a class is name and describe it, which I think the documentary does a good job of like, this is what's happening. It's its own system of rules. And for students that have never heard that, um, I think it's affirming for black students uh, and uh, really informative for students who are not black, who you know have 
uh, are, are more familiar with racist narratives about black language of, of it, yeah, just being wrong or, um, yeah, just being wrong set of standard English, right? And so as a language teacher, I appreciate um, getting to uh, share some of those things that um, were expressed in the documentary. All right, thank you for that. And last but certainly not least, Lauren. Yeah, so um, a little bit about me and my work. So I am a speech language pathologist um, and currently working to become a researcher as I am in this program. But um, my recent work has been um, studying um, differences in the amount of African American language used in um, narr and narrative features, like as in like um, plot setting characters and things like that um, from story retells of African American speaking children, African American language speaking children, um, after hearing a story in their language and um, what general American English. Um, currently, right now, I'm working on um, a study at Children's Hospital along with CSUN, and she's doing something a little bit different. But I'm examining verbal and nonverbal language um, from in differences in outcomes. Um, from early preterm black children and white children using a language assessment that is not as commonly used, but it gives like a more, um, I guess, a more full picture than the traditional language assessments that we have in particular within our field. So that's currently what I am doing right now, amongst a lot of other things um, <laughs> on my uh, busy schedule. Um, so for this documentary, um, personal takeaway. So this is like the fifth or sixth time I've watched this. Um, I watched it with friends by myself. Um, actually, Dr. Walt Wolfram sent me a copy, <laughs> my own personal copy. So I've seen it a lot. But every time that I watch it, I do um, try to look at it from a first timer lens, because the more you read, the more I connect things and say, oh, OK, I remember when so and so said this in this article or this book. Um, or I try to catch things that I probably missed um, by watching it um, multiple times. But honestly, like for in terms of what it was, it was the purpose for and what it was doing, I really believe that it is a good um, documentary. And I know like we can go deep into this. And I know um, Dr. Perry would know in terms of like being a linguist, you can go, you can dive a little bit deeper. But the foundational things that were presented, um, I felt like it was really, really good. One of the things that I enjoyed was that it explained both the positive and negative perspective of actually Black people and how what their viewpoints are in speaking African American language. So I guess part to make this a little personal and even in the documentary, talking Black, like what does that mean? Um, that what does that identify as? And for me, I know that was something that I faced many times. Um, and it could be because what intonation, we don't sound as urban enough or you know, like, or I guess what people ideally set aside. And it's not just from um, my like white peers or other cultures, but like from within my own group. And so those were the, some of the things that I did appreciate about explaining and extending to what that truly, truly means um, uh, amongst the historical aspects and its meaning to the black community often and through its influence in American society. So overall, with all that being said, my biggest takeaway, um, <laughs> from the documentary as a speaker of African-American English or African-American language, it was identity. Um, for me, like understanding like the historical foundation, kind of like Dr. Perry said, that affirmation that how I speak is good and it's right. Um, you have to understand when you come from a middle-class family, I'm not a first generation student. A lot of the people that I'm centered around um, are very educated, college educated. And when we say, girl, I be rolling, like doing stuff like that, like, you know, we're told, excuse me, what is that from? from? And personally, like, but from a perspective of like my mom, she'd be like, oh, you sound straight Memphis. Um, it's not business, it's business. Like, you know, just trying to make sure that I can go back and forth between the two. Um, but even to explain the essence of our language to even my parents who have been, have this mindset that it's like, has a negative connotation as well too. I find myself always trying to say, no, look, this is, this is right. Like what we're saying, speaking is right. We're just told that this is not access. But to me, I felt like um, the identity part was very important because um, subconsciously I was aware to hear, like to hear from the mouths of like linguists 
and speakers like reassures that importance and that connection. And I always say, like Beyonce said, it's my access. Like I'm good on any MLK Boulevard. Like it's my access to my community to get to talk to them to as a professional, I'm I'm considered a communication specialist. So it it presents that rapport with them, that natural breath of fresh air that, okay, I got somebody who will understand me and look out for me and things like that. So though that was my um, ultimate takeaway was that identity portion of it. Thank you for that. And I'll turn it over to you, Denise. Uh, Denise, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Just wanted to thank everybody for their wonderful responses. So what advice would you give to teachers when thinking about cultural differences in their students' language development? We'll start with you, Cson. Thank you. I would encourage teachers, educators, and professionals to see the child for who they are. Um, get to know your students and build trust. I one thing that I always say is, don't generalize by group, because the moment you do that you lose the person in the group. And so, you know, I'm, I'm Colombian, I'm Hispanic, so I get all the time, oh, you gotta try this taco place. I'm like, uh, we don't eat tacos in Colombia. It's a thing, you know? <laughs> like, uh, you know, I have a friend who's black and she was adopted at the age of 12 from Africa. And the other day we were teasing, she was talking about like dating and uh, she's like, oh, it's gotta be a white guy. And I'm like, what? I'm like, what do you mean? And she's like, I am the whitest black girl you'll know, Cisan. And you know, like, I was like, wow, I made a judgment there, right? Like I generalized and, and I failed. So to my fellow colleagues and educators, I always say language develops very different in very different children. So don't generalize. Um, and when you are concerned about a child's communication development, you know, turn to other people, turn to your school speech language pathologist, uh, just to make sure that you know the difference between a language difference and a disorder. And that's so important when we're talking about our children who speak, um, you know, African American English. Because a lot of times we're judging and we're saying, oh, you know, like the documentary said, like it's slang, it's bad, you know, like, oh, they need to talk right. No, you got to educate yourself and you got to educate and advocate with those people around you so that we are doing justice for all of our children, especially in this case for our Black children who deserve our respect and our trust. Thank you. And thank you for reminding us that we need to remember that all children develop at their own pace and they're all they're they all have individual differences. Thank you. Okay, Ebony, you'd like to yes. go next? Yes. Well, I, I mean, I don't even know. I, I think she said it really, really exactly what she, what she stated. And I think, you know, as someone who worked with um, educators in the early childhood education field. Uh, what she said at the end is so important. Be, be very careful and conscious. So one of the things I would say immediately is to check your own stuff, check your own biases, um, educate yourself, just as Cisan was saying, um, the more you know, the more you grow, right? And so you want to make sure that you're educating yourself first. I want you to be careful because if you don't, you can end up... Um, we can end up with some microaggressions, right? So things that I've given an example um, that someone may think is a compliment is um, that I've heard, I can't even tell you how many times is that you speak so well. And I would imagine that that's coming from a place of you saying that that's a compliment. Um, however, what do, you, what do you mean by that? And, and that's a microaggression. I speak so well to be black. I speak so well to be a woman. What, are, what exactly are you saying about that? And so just to make sure that you're checking your, your own stuff, right? We all bring stuff, all of us. There's nobody, anybody who says they don't is not telling the truth and do better. 
We all bring stuff and we have to check our stuff and understand how it impacts our interactions, including with children and children hang on to what educators say. You are, they're supposed to trust you, right? And so you have to be very careful and conscious of what you say to them um, about how they speak, right? And, and one of, in the documentary, um, one of the women said, well, when you talk about my language, you're not just talking about me, you're saying everybody in my family is wrong. You, you're not just saying me, you're saying everything I grew up with, my history is wrong, right? And so you have to be very careful as an educator what you say um, because it has a serious impact. So one of the things I think I just want to end with is it is important for educators to make sure that their children feel included and valued, right? We want our children to feel, know that they belong here. But what I'm going to ask in educators is how do they know? How do they know in your classroom, at your school, that they belong there? Um, you have to make sure that they feel included and that includes how they speak um, and what they bring to the table and to view it as a dual language and as a strength, right? So the ability to speak and code switch is a strength. That is a dual language, right? However, it's been viewed as ignorant for so long. And so that we, we need to view it as a strength, this child has the ability to code switch. This child has the ability, they are, are bilingual. So just to keep those things in mind. Thank you so much for that. And for reminding us about those little microaggressions that so many of us have experienced. Okay, um, Damien. Sure. Uh, first of all, the first two answers, I think, um, were mic drops, so we can probably end it at this, <laughs> at this point. But um, I think one of the, I, I kind of like Malcolm X said, you can't solve any problem until you get to the root cause. Uh, and I think in this uh, understanding, particularly when advising uh, educators, is first to understand that the system of education is rooted in confirmation bias. Right. So if you're going to be teaching a kid uh, who who comes to a space hoping to be able to bring their authentic self, your job is to inform and inspire that child in their authentic state, not to get them to assimilate to some kind of system of confirmational bias. Right. Um, once you begin to plant once you then understand your task, then you got to move to what I think Ebony said, and I'm probably going to paraphrase this, uh, but no kid cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So you really got to know that this, this person is, is coming to your class, and this is a human being, first of all. This person is coming to your class, and they're not broken, right? They're coming to your class basically asking you to provide them with something that they know that they don't know, right? Um, and if you're talking about it from the perspective of race, I think, and I, like I said, I taught for 13 years and I had this experience where, you know, my, my black students were often viewed as, as speaking quote unquote broken language, uh, a broken English or the term at the time was ebonics, right? Um, uh, but I also had a, a, a transfer student come from France and nobody said that their English was broken. The white kid from France. Nobody said their English was broken, right? But literally it was very difficult to understand that person because their native tongue was different. Their heritage, and nobody went to them and, 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 and told them that, you know, they came from a, a, a broken home or a broken system or they must not made assumptions about where they came from. No, they just assumed that because they were French and that they were white, that there was something unique about how they spoke. Afford that same understanding to young black people, young brown people, right? There's a uniqueness, there's a richness, there's an authenticity. There's nothing broken about it. It's just different and unique. And so once you begin to approach it from the perspective of humanizing individuals as they are, accepting them for the authentic people that they are, and then also understanding that the system that you're working in, you almost have to build a car where you drive it because you have to deconstruct this racist education system 
while you're informing and inspiring young people. That's a very difficult task. And then at the same time, you're being forced to like standardize everything, right? <laughs> Through all these tests and norms and all this kind of stuff. So it's almost, you're almost, your hand is almost forced. Hold on to the fact that you are teaching people, not subject matter. The teaching of the people is first, right? And when you hold on to that, it makes it a little bit easier. Thank you so much for that rem re reminder, Dana. Okay, Cole, how would you respond? Thanks, oh yeah, this is, this is great hearing everyone and what they have to say. Um, yeah, it seems like a great place to start with what Damien was talking about, the root cause, right? Like, we can't talk about cultural differences and language development with it without, like, thinking about our environment in which we have to humanize kids uh, and we have to work to embrace Blackness in a way that doesn't exploit or stereotype it because of the anti-Blackness that we experience in the world, or that we're all exposed to. Like, I don't experience it. We all see and um i i had a when this question had me thinking about this quote from a artist activist educator j murray hill um that was part of a call to action that said what do i do that screams i value black life no matter what um and i, and I think that speaking it speaks to the question that dr griffin was asking how do black students know that we value them right um, and so, I, I mean, for me, if, if you are not a black person, you've, you've, you've just got a, a lot to learn to start with. You're starting behind. And so you've got so much to learn, so much to unlearn. Uh, but, but when I think of my black students, I, I know that they've all met nice white teachers. And I, and I write that as, as one word, ah, oh, the nice white teacher who really seem like nice people but, but you're just, you just you're in, if you're in their class, you're waiting to see, have they actually done the work to like unlearn those biases that Dr. Griffin and Damien are talking about? Like, thank you for speaking to that. Like, um, have, has this nice white teacher, like I'm sure they're a nice person to their families, to their neighbors, but have they worked on the anti-blackness they've observed or absorbed in society? Because um, because these nice white teachers will tell you that your language is wrong because they care about you, and so maybe they have good intentions, but they they they're not even correct <laughs> that black English or African American English is wrong. So I mean, that's what I'm thinking about when I thinking about cultural cultural differences and how we support students. What are the things we're doing? Uh, to quote again, J. Marie Hill, uh, what do I do as a teacher that screams, I value black life no matter what? Thank you, Cole. And now Lauren, your response. Um, so for me, I feel like everybody really touched on the, the hot points or the high points of um, telling teachers. So I have so I was, while listening and thinking at the same time, um, I had two perspectives. Uh, the first one is um, don't go into other understanding other cultures as a white savior complex. I feel like that's when you when you do that or you say like, oh, they're from low socioeconomic status. I have to do this and I have to do that. Like to you, you know, you have bring this perspective that it looks like it's, I guess it's wrong, but to them, their environment is home. It's kind of like when my mom says, I never knew we were poor. I knew, she was like, that's, that's the, the home foundation. I didn't know I was poor until I was being compared. And so once we start comparing um, the de development based on this, what this mainstream culture of, um, of, what standard, what's expected to learn, that's when we start falling down and breaking. And that's when you see the divide um, within that. And that's why we have what this black white academic achievement gap, like we have a lot of these different things that um, unfold in all of these categories. Um, and so to, to kind of like, I guess, contradict what I'm saying, but not really, I read a chapter in Articulate While Black by um, a link professor. Um, she's also a linguist, Geneva Smitherman in, um, Sami, Professor Sami Aline in the chapter six, if you ever, if you guys get a chance to read it, it really talks about, especially for Black 
um, children to understand to change the game. We, we know as adults there is a game, but these children do not know that. And so when we're explicit about teaching the power of being able to navigate a system that obviously wasn't created for us, like we have to be real with what's going on. Um, yes, there are levels and layers to it per age wise, but I believe like the earlier we start, the better we can because um, it gives them access, right? Like in the documentary, it talks about speaking general American English is access to other advances that you want to get into. So when we start teaching about the true meaning of code switching, because think about it for a black person, code switching is not just me saying, hello, my name is Lauren today. It's my hair has to be straightened. My clothes need to look a certain way. I can't wear black empowerment t-shirts because then now I'm uh, anti this or I'm too pro-black or I'm this radical rah-rah strong black woman stepping in. So it's, it's a whole culture flip, right? Like it's not just my language, how I speak, what I'm saying, it's everything about me to make me be acceptable in a space that technically not, I may not always be accepted. So those are the things that I think, I think when you can get real with children or especially like when you're starting in that later stage, when they start realizing things, um, I think it explains a little bit more, but it takes you again, like Dr. Green said, and everyone else said, like, you got to check your own input devices. You have to have a starting lineup as well. So that's what, um, that's my uh, thoughts on that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing your perspective on that. Now I'm going to turn it back over to my friend, Bella. Um, hi, everyone. So for this one, I think we, uh, I am going to mix up the order a little bit um, just to keep you on your toes. Um, but the question is, what do you think will be the biggest barrier to both normalizing AAVE and really overall incorporating culturally responsive language learning? Um, and, and just just to be a, a little more inclusive, I think instead of schools, um, in schools and uh, a lot of folks on this call work in childcare centers, which um, just have a have a mix, right? We're always talking about different vernacular and, and whatnot, but um, some people do, you know, count them as schools, and I always would call it school. Um, but just so really kind of enveloping also the, those kind of places where learning takes place and. Um, so we, we are going to mix it up, like I said, and I'm going to, um, I'm just going to, going to go, uh, Damien, could you go first? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I think the biggest barrier, uh, for normalizing anything from, um, a marginalized group is the fact that, uh, racism is profitable. <laughs> And so when you think about this largely in the perspective of an educational system um, that, you know, as I mentioned before, is sort of rooted in systemic racism, uh, where you are standardizing things. I don't know if you guys remember, like when they did the whole standardized test movement and, they, and, and it was in the Bush administration and all this kind of stuff, those testing companies made millions, right? And, and it sort of had this trickle down effect to all the, the, the schools and the schools that had the greater resources based on the taxes and the property values in the community in which they live. They did well and the, the, the access was limited for kids in the urban core. That's a part of that system. And I think the thing that would be the biggest barrier in normalizing it is the profitability of, of, of that level of systemic racism. Um, and that's with just about anything, but particularly in, in, in this particular space. However, I think that there's an antidote to that. Um, uh, and the antidote to that is sentimentally, um, I think that caring about a young person is equally as profitable. <laughs> uh, and, and one of the reasons why I say that, and I say that there's some, there's some sentimentality to that, but then there's also some pragmatism to it as well. When you think about building out uh, a workforce for a new society, right? And I think we've all experienced this even now uh, as we're coming out of COVID, everything resets. So we had to be innovative and change how we did absolutely everything, right? And, and you didn't necessarily have to speak any language in order to be able to know that how to operate Zoom systems and all this kind of stuff and be remote and virtual and all this kind of stuff. 
Uh, and so we adopt it pretty quickly so that we can have an understanding and, and, and find that connective tissue. I think the antidote to any of this, these barriers is that level of innovation and also understanding that when you have a person who can be multilingual uh, and not just with language, but with uh, other kinds of systems of communication, like what we're dealing with now, basically what you build out is a more robust workforce, right? And there's greater profitability in that, It, but there, it, it, and, and so with that greater pro profitability, if profit is the, the baseline, right, or the thing that could be the greatest barrier, that is an antidote to that. I would like to say that it's also just the right thing to do to normalize the authentic, authentic experiences of other people, but this is America, so I'm not entirely sure that that's, they're doing things because it's right is, is what people uh, ultimately end up doing, what the system ultimately ends up doing. I will say that you don't have to do it because it's right. You can do it because it's effective. So now let's move the subjectivity, remove the subjectivity of right and wrong and move towards the objectivity of effective versus ineffective. And this is more effective. Thank you for that. Um, how about Lauren, what do you think? Well, if you would have asked me this question, um, maybe last week, I probably would have had a more positive perspective. Um, I know I said I'd be positive, but this one really, um, I guess within the current climate of what's been going on um, in education and conversing with some of my friends, um, understanding the 1619 project and these things, I actually re-questioned the question in the terms of like, will it be like, you know, this, we have the biggest barrier is power for one, right? William Labov, a famous linguist who studied African-American English and Walt Wolfram said, it's about power. Who has the army or who has the Navy? If black people were in charge, guess what would be the standard or this general, right? It would be African-American language and we wouldn't be having this conversation really, right? And so politics is another one. You got societal norms, this majority rules perspective, and of course, these biases of what things think. I think there are people doing the work. Actually, I know people who are doing the work of deconstructing the syllabus, trying to be um, exp like expanding upon um, culturally responsive language learning within like um, academia, along with, you know, it's trickling down into the grade schools. But I just think it's interesting, like we just talked about this newly passed law that says Juneteenth is a federal holiday, but then you have states like Georgia passing laws and saying things that have, I quote, um, and I quote this, have guardrails around classroom discussions about race and controversial events. And to me, I find that problematic because how can we normalize something or even incorporate a culturally, culturally responsive language learning if we really cannot talk about the true history and why it is important. And so for me, I, th this futuristic, in a perfect world, yeah, but right now, I don't see it being normalized. I still think this is going to still be a discussion. I still think that, um, and to be honest, all Black people don't believe we speak Black language. You know what I'm saying? There's people who truly believe that what is that and that it, they have taken on the perspective of what it's negatively meant. And so there's a lot of barriers, but those I feel like are the biggest ones. So that's my <laughs> perspective. Good. Yes. Please be honest. <laughs> um, please, please don't feel like we have to stick to optimism. We, you know, we come into these conversations to have to to hear the difficult truths too, and to hear the honesty. So I I do really appreciate it. Um, we all do. Uh, Cole, how about you? Thanks. Um, it's I mean, you all. It's great to follow such brilliant answers. Um, because my first thought uh, in terms of the biggest barrier to incorporate, incorporating culturally responsive teaching is that it has to involve more than language. It has to be bigger than that. Um, I, I think you both talked about that so far. Lauren named power, Damien named systemic racism, right? That's, that's the barrier. Like it's not just getting, that, getting a program or a, way, a certain pedagogy into the schools because I don't know, I mean, we can't, we can't expect culturally responsive language learning by itself to upend these institutions that have built, been built on white standards, much less 
you know, provide some big challenge to anti-blackness, it's going to take more. Um, I, I have another quote for this answer too, um, from Bettina Love, who wrote the uh, wrote a book recent in the last couple of years on abolitionist teaching, and she says, "For equity work to work, it must be handed to the community. We have to actually trust the people we say we want to empower." to make structural changes, not just tinker at the edges of injustice. And so especially that last part for me, like we can't just tinker at the edges of injustice, just uh, spoke to me, because I, I think we could, um, we could focus really blindly or really narrowly for our whole careers on really specific things in ways that just tinker at the edge of injustice without challenging these bigger problems. And they're all, there's all these intertwined things, right? Damien already mentioned standardized testing. We've got police in schools, racism being banned in classrooms. And then even the idea of neighborhood schools and public funding, well, we, our neighborhoods are racially segregated. So there's all these layers of systemic racism that shape our schools that uh, make this that make every little thing th that you try to do to challenge anti-blackness a big fight and even if you tried to do take on something smaller like teaching critical race theory or incorporating culturally responsive language language learning there's going to be a huge backlash just to get just to even tinker at the edges of injustice much less face it directly but i mean i am optimistic to be in the presence of some People doing great work. Thank you. Um, how about uh, Dr. Griffin? Could you go next? Absolutely. I'm going to keep it really short because the, the, I don't disagree with anything the other panelists have said thus far. Um, but when I think about the biggest barrier for me, the first term, first thing I think of is ignorance. That is the biggest barrier, in my opinion. Um, and taking action is the privilege of knowledge. And so in order to even take action, you have to be knowledgeable. You have to rid yourself of your ignorance. And so I think ignorance is the biggest thing. We have to get to move beyond tolerance to appreciation. Um, and then also the last thing I'll say is we need to check who's at the decision-making tables. Thank you, thank you. Um, and Sison, last but certainly not least. I'll be short too. When I read this question, the first thing that came to my mind is me. I am the biggest barrier and I wanna challenge everyone who is in this call. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot said and that I think a lot of people gave, you know, hit the nail on the head with the answers, right? And what the biggest barrier is. Um, but if you're in a classroom, and if you are servicing a family, the biggest barrier ultimately is you, what you know and what you bring and what you, how you respect that person that you've got in front of you. Um, there's a big stigma against dialect amongst whites and blacks and Hispanics and all sorts of groups. Um, and so we need to fight that. And you need to fight that, like me, with my conversations, my family, my friends, um, because we know the systematic issues and we know the barrier there, but we also have to acknowledge and educate ourselves and look at within. So that's what I think. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your thoughtful responses. It, it spanned a very good, a very good um, topic, I think. So I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Jamal. All right. Sounds like a plan. And we're going to mix it up again. Keep you guys on your virtual toes here. Our question is, how have you made a commitment to change your behavior as it relates to racism? And I'm going to give that to Lauren first. Keep you on your toes. <laughs> you did, right? So, um, OK, this was a really I'm going to just be honest. This was a hard question for me. And I'm going to tell you guys why, because I just really believe black people can't be racist. And I believe that because um, 
it comes from a place of understanding superior power and being the inferior race. Um, and so um, I just believe that, uh, okay, we just don't, you normally care for white people because of our history, right? Like the more you watch Mississippi Burning, all these movies, you get angry, you get mad, right? And it comes from a place of preference. Like I just rather not um, be around white people. I feel like for me, I know it takes, you got to show me, show yourself approved like that I can trust you um, because I just have this prejudice in my mind that I, and I do have what I work on is my prejudice is that I have my own guard up based on my own past experiences. So I believe I have made a commitment to control my prejudices because I can't talk about being equal if I am not doing the same right. And so um, to try to be less assuming that white people think and have the same motives, it's really hard sometimes when you feel microaggressions through um, <laughs> emails, telephone calls, com just typical conversations and things like that. It just comes from a place of like, mm, I don't know, vi like vibes, we use this word vibes, like feeling people's energy. You can kind of tell they're talking through you and not to you um, type situations. But I am learning, it is an ongoing process that um, to stop generalizing um, and realize that it may, it, it comes from a place of projection of themselves. That's why I truly believe that they're projecting an insecurity off on me that I have no control over. So for me, I need to keep that in the back of my mind. And I know people have this different, differing opinions, but I know this is something for Lauren um, to work on um, because, um, you know, just from like, just those experiences are just, watching the news or just you know listening to conversations and things like that um so in terms of other cultural connections i really find myself like connecting with other cultures from other communities it's like this natural like we belong together um kumbaya moment um but when it comes to um white people sometimes i just I have my guard up but i'm i'm learning to be better so it's an ongoing process. So remember, we got to check ourselves, our own implicit biases, because I have some too, you know, as well. So that that is um, <laughs> that is my uh, commitment. Um, yes. <laughs> Thank you for your transparency. Talking about shaking it up. Thank you for your transparency. I really appreciate that. Cole, I'm gonna send the question to you. All right. Thanks. I'll start by just expressing my gratitude for. Like I'd say the movement for black lives of the last eight years or so, that movement uh, and the historical movements that like Black Lives Matter has built on. Um, I, for, for me, I think organizers, activists and movement workers have been opening up new ways to build a new world and tear down the old. Um, that's what I thought of for this question for changing my behavior as it relates to racism. Um, so, cause I mean, even as a teacher, the things my students need, um, I don't know, learning the imperfect in tense in Spanish is not necessarily their number one need all the time. Even having a really skillful teacher or it, it won't change the material conditions of their lives. Um, I, I think, I, I think changing my behavior as it relates to racism I have to li listen to black people, listen to my black students, my black friends. Um, I have to find out the needs of my black trans students, my black students experiencing homelessness, uh, who don't have control over their reproductive health, whose neighborhoods are occupied by police. I mean, I, I feel like there's a lot of different places to plug in. Um, and I, and I, and I, and I want to do that for my students and for the communities I'm a part of in Cincinnati. I, I, I mean, I kind of wanted to also name some of the, the groups that I think are doing good work right now that are uh, relevant to, you know, the people's lives in Cincinnati. So like I think of the Greater Cincinnati Homeless Coalition that is doing a lot of work to get affordable housing going. And um, there's an anti-police brutality coalition doing work to lift up the voices of families affected by police violence. Uh, there's a young activist coalition of high schoolers trying to replace 
punitive discipline in Cincinnati public schools with transformative justice. And so, I don't know, I wanted to plug those names just as like, oh yeah, these are things I wanna support. Uh, and I think that they, they're, they're part of this. Uh, we were just talking about how it's all, we, we have to get at the root, like Damien said, we have to challenge the systemic racism and I'm glad that there's local work to plug into. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Cole. You guys love all transparency. Y'all getting so transparent. We ain't going to be able to see y'all before long. So I really appreciate that. I'll send the question to Damien. Um, how, how have you made commitment? I've committed to being angrier. <laughs> um, and I, I, this is that's a very true statement, by the way. Um, and, and more in, intentional and in focused. Uh, there was a time where my anger, and I don't know if you, you guys can't see me, but I'm 6'5", 250 pounds. Uh, so I'm a pretty big guy. So being ang recklessly angry uh, and black uh, can get you killed. Um, being intentional and angry uh, and focused can literally, uh, with a, the right aim, deconstruct systems. And so I know how the game is played now, being this old, right? And so you know uh, where the where the cogs are, you know what the politics are, where the where the where the money funnels from, and how all of that sort of continues to prop up the system of racism. Uh, so before I was really, really idealistic, under believing that you know, sort of my my passion about the the topic uh, would would cause long term sustainable change. Um, what I've grown uh, to understand is that my intention, uh, sort of focused intention, and in sort of logical approaches to deconstructing things uh, is really much more sustainable. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I've committed to being angrier and, and, and with, a, with a more focused intention. And I'll tell you why, and I'll give just this brief anecdote. I was in a restaurant this afternoon and uh, I was sitting at a bar next to a young white woman. Uh, and I think we probably finished up eating roughly around the same time. And when it came time for that young white woman to pay, she didn't have cash and she didn't have a credit card, but she told the cashier, that she can write down her credit card number and the cashier agreed to that. And the first thing I thought about was George Floyd was killed for a uh, counterfeit $20 bill. And I was furious <laughs> because I remember growing up in Cincinnati having to walk through stores with my money in my hand so that the people in the store wouldn't follow me around. Right, and so there's this constant need of proving something when this young white woman had to prove nothing. She didn't have to show her ID or anything. She just, she wrote it down like on a, the back of a receipt. And the lady said to her, well, what's the, what's the expiration date? That was the only confirmation that she required. And that young woman had her meal and got up and left. And I thought to myself, could I do something like that? Absolutely not. And again, so then I, so I, I, I asked the manager, that was me being intentional, right? So I asked the manager, you know, like, is that normal practice? You know what I mean? What would have happened if that was a person of color? Um, and it was already too late, the transaction that had been had, and the transaction went through, but, you know, my question to them was, how do you know that's who, whose card it was? <laughs> You know what I mean? That right there was more than a counterfeit $20 bill. It was more than a counterfeit $20 bill. And at the very least, what I did was I brought it to their attention. Now, I, when I did it, I still stood up and I dwarfed the manager. Uh, so I had to be careful that I wasn't coming off aggressive. But I did want him to know that I was coming off very, very intentional because these kinds of systems continue to be perpetuated not in 10 years ago, not a year and a half ago, literally four hours ago, <laughs> four hours ago. So obviously then there's still more work to be done. So my anger is, is, is heightened, but my, my, my intentionality is, is, is a bit sharp. Thank you for the, in, the, in, the intention, always intention. I love that. 
Appreciate y'all's transparency again. Now I'm a little hesitant to turn it over to Miss Ebony. You guys are not only dropping the mic. I don't even think Swayze has a mic at this point. You guys have done an excellent job. So Dr. Griggs Griffin, how would you respond? Oh man, I'm sort of like sitting here like, wow, right? Like now, mm, interesting. But I want to say to you, Damien, or anyone else who wants to hear it, it sounded like I, I, we show a video called Cracking the Cold, a trip to the grocery store. And it's a, it's a short, um, you can see it on YouTube, that <laughs> gives a similar example of, of what you just spoke about and the decision that the, the um, person of color had to make in that moment of how to respond. And the fact that we even have to stop and think about how we respond. But anyway, that's a, that's a whole nother. So it, it just speaks to what his example he just gave today. So how do I uh, challenge um, or my commitment to change? My commitment to change, how do I make? Challenge myself. Like when uh, Seesaw is saying, me, I'm, I'm the barrier. I wanted to, you know, here comes that, you know, church thing they were talking about in the video, get up, say hallelujah, absolutely, right? Um, absolutely. The challenge of myself and my own biases and my own, uh, you know, understanding that we meet people and we meet people at their group membership because we don't know them in, as individuals. And when I meet someone at their group membership, what comes up for me and how does that impact my interaction with them, right? And so I have to check that very often. I have to check that um, because those those interactions based on group membership often come from my past experiences. It comes from what I heard at the, the table and in the household, the meeting, all of that comes up for me as I interact. And so I have to check my stuff. I have to recognize I have stuff and then I have to check my stuff. But also um, the term intentional, Damien just spoke about, I'm very intentional about my interactions and my conversations and the dialogues I have, but also just doing some work. I, I spend time doing the work, doing the work on myself, doing the work on, um, on me and, and then taking that and doing it with others. And so I spent a lot of time um, having these types of conversations, talking about systemic racism, talking about um, uh, diversity, inclusion, equity, and what that means. I do it in schools, I do it um, in businesses, and really just helping people to become comfortable. I work for an organization that talks about strengthening our muscles to have these types of conversations to get comfortable with having challenging conversations and to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. There is no growth in the comfort zone and there's no comfort in the growth zone. And so it takes a lot of work. It's not easy. And, and that's what I do. Thank you for that. And last but certainly not least, Sasan. I just second everybody. <laughs> um, I am committed to speaking up within my community. I am committed to educating myself. Um, I, I wanted to throw out uh, a name of a book in case anybody's interested here that I think every white person needs to read. And um, it's um, How to Be Anti Racist by Kennedy. Kendi, I, I wrote his name, Kendi Ibram, I think you say his last name. Um, and I think that educating ourselves is number one, that's key. I, can, I, can, I can't say that enough, right? So I'm committed to that. I'm committed to educating myself. I'm committed to asking the hard questions because it's okay not to know, you know, like, you know, I'm a minority, I'm, but it's okay not to know, and it's okay to ask, you know, and ask, and do ask, and do have difficult conversations. I mean, and I come to Lauren, Lauren is a great friend of mine, and I come to her all the time. If I have to, I'll ask, because, I mean, it's okay not to know. Uh, so I'm committed to that. I'm committed to asking. I'm committed to advocating. I'm committed to educating. Um, and I also have been really reflecting on the need for more research in this area. Um, so I'm committed to that. I'm committed to 
in the near future when I'm an independent researcher, remembering this, that we need more research that can potentially transfer into policy that will transfer into training our teachers and our educators on best evidence-based practices in schools. But what is evidence-based if we don't have enough research in this? And so I am committed to that. That's it, even though like, it seems like I was gonna say more, but that's it. <laughs> all right, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you all for your great uh, input. I do have the time uh, here as we have about one minute left. So we wanna be respectful of uh, everyone's time, including the panelists and, and try to end on time here. We got through five of the six questions. So we did pretty well, um, very uh, fascinating conversation. And uh, before we wrap up here, we do want to share some more information with you here. Um, Southwest Ohio AEYC will be continuing to provide engaging and timely events events throughout the rest of the year on topics ranging from equity to child guidance to even avoiding burnout as early childhood educators. So if you want to stay in the loop on these upcoming events, then please consider joining our mailing list, liking us on Facebook and following us on Twitter. I've got all those links pasted into the chat now as well. You should be able to click those to get to everything or you can type them into your um, browser search bar. So that concludes our panel discussion for today. Again, I wanna thank you all so much. Again, to our panelists, Cisan Cuervo, Dr. Ebony Griggs Griffin, Damian Hoskins, Dr. Cole Perry, and Lauren Prather. Really just an incredible conversation, like Jamal said, um, uh, and Damian said, uh, it's not just a mic drop, we don't even have a mic anymore. I like that. <laughs> Really, really compelling conversation. So thank you so much for your time and attention and your expertise and your perspectives today. We really do value it. So thank you very much. And thank you also to all of our attendees. We hope that you enjoyed this compelling discussion. And thank you, of course, finally, to the sponsor of today's event, Learning Grove. And if you have any questions or would like to join or get involved with Southwest Ohio AUIC, please email us at info at .org. So thanks again. And I'll give a round of applause like Bella did for our panelists today. <laughs> All right, thanks again, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day. We really appreciate it. Thank you.